Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Again, welcome and thank you for joining Dragon Trail's June webinar, where we will be talking about post-pandemic trends in Chinese tourist shopping. UN Tourism announced a few weeks ago that China was once again the world's highest spending international tourism source market in 2023. So today we're going to speak to some experts in the field to see how that money is being spent and specifically how it's being spent on shopping. My name is Sienna Perulis Cook, and I'm Dragon Trails of Communications. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers today from the retail and financial sectors, and I'm really delighted to welcome Silvia Martinez de Tejada, Tourism Director for Galeria Canalejas in Madrid, Marcelo Molinari, Central Director of International Markets for the Bistra Collection, Zhang Yifan from the Marketing Department of Union Pay International, and Mathieu Grac from tax refund provider Global Blue. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we're really looking forward to hearing your insights and learning from your experience. Now, before we hear from our guest speakers, I'm going to start the session today with a brief intro of these four shopping, including some top line numbers and insights from Dragon Trail's latest market research. Then you'll hear from each panelist individually before we all come together for a panel discussion. The full session today will last for an hour, and I'd like to leave the last five or 10 minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, please do feel free to submit your questions at any time during the webinar by using the Q&A button on your Zoom control panel, and we will answer as many as possible at the end. One more thing to note is I will be sending out all of today's presentation slides to everybody later today, so you'll have all of the materials for future reference, and we'll also be sharing a link to a recording of the webinar, so you'll be able to review that or share it with colleagues who you think might be interested but weren't able to attend the live event. Now, just in case this is your first time joining a Dragon Trail webinar, I wanted to quickly introduce who we are and what we do. Dragon Trail International was founded in 2009 and is headquartered in Beijing. We help tourism brands and businesses around the world to connect to Chinese consumers and the Chinese travel trade through digital marketing, events, market research, and representation services. We're proud to work with clients on every continent, including destinations, hotels, retailers, airlines, and attractions. And you can find more information about our services, our clients, case studies of our work, and lots of other information about Chinese tourism and marketing on our website, www.dragontrail.com. So now let's start by talking a little bit about Chinese tourist shopping. When I speak to people in the tourism industry who work in the Chinese market, shopping almost always comes up. Compared to the early days of Chinese outbound tourism, Chinese travelers may now be spending and focusing more on experiences such as dining or cultural activities, but shopping is definitely still an essential part of the Chinese outbound travel experience. In Dragon Trail's latest Chinese traveler sentiment survey conducted this spring, nearly a quarter of respondents said that shopping would be one of the themes for their next outbound trip. In a survey conducted at the end of 2022 by travel website Chongyo, shopping was also identified as one of the top outbound travel themes. Now, similar to Dragon Trail survey, we see that natural scenery, visiting musty icons, um, and experiencing local culture do rank higher, but shopping is still included as one of the priorities. <clears throat> now, going back to Dragon Trail's Spring 2024 Traveler Sentiment Survey, we look specifically at that 23.9% of respondents who selected shopping as a theme for their next outbound trip to find out more about Chinese shoppers. First, what I think is really interesting is that a full 100% of survey respondents who chose shopping as a the theme for their next outbound trip are actually traveling outbound in 2024. They had all already traveled abroad this year, or they had bookings or plans for outbound trips later in the year. In comparison, only 56% of travelers who didn't pick shopping as a theme had outbound travel plans or bookings. So we can see that outbound travel intent is actually much higher among shopping enthusiasts. Looking at the demographics of shoppers versus non-shoppers, we see that shoppers are slightly younger and more likely to be female. 
They're more likely to live in first and new first tier cities in China, and perhaps unsurprisingly, they're likely to have higher monthly household incomes. As for uh, their product preferences, shoppers, sh uh, sorry, on average, shoppers have higher outbound travel budgets than other travelers, with 30% of them allocating in between 30 and 50,000 renminbi um, for their next outbound trip, and 23% of them will spend um, over 10,000 renminbi on shopping compared to just 14% of other travelers. As for product preferences, shoppers show stronger purchasing intention in most categories, including clothing, cosmetics, electronics, and jewelry. The most popular product category for all Chinese travelers is local foods. And after that, the shoppers are most likely to buy cosmetics, handmade souvenirs, and clothing and accessories. Now, there has been a major shift in Chinese luxury shopping since 2019, and this is impacted by two factors in particular. Um, first was COVID and its ensuing travel restrictions, and second is the development of Hainan as a tax-free shopping destination. So comparing 2019 and 2023, it used to be that 70% of Chinese luxury shopping happened overseas and 30% happened domestically. By last year, this had flipped with 70% of luxury spending happening domestically and 30% overseas. Now, obviously, as outbound travel continues to recover, we will continue to see a change uh, in this balance, but it's very unlikely that we're going to return to 70% of luxury travel happening, I mean, luxury shopping happening overseas um, because of the development of Hainan, as well as efforts to crack down on Daigo shopping and other factors. Um, but that said, Chinese shoppers are going to continue to shop overseas, and for retailers to be able to attract and effectively service these clients, it's essential to understand the reasons and motivations for shopping while traveling abroad. So, first, product availability, where not all product lines are available to buy in mainland China. Second, shoppers are increasingly likely to be looking for local brands that also might not be available in China. And third, although the price difference for luxury goods is not as high as it used to be, it's still often significantly cheaper to purchase items overseas, especially if a tax refund is available. Then there's also the shopping experience overseas, and I think this is particularly important. Retailers that are able to offer a really special, unique experience for Chinese tourists are going to be able to successfully attract them. Travelers will also be looking for souvenirs and gifts to buy while they're abroad. And then lastly, and this ties in with shopping for local brands as well, there's an added emotional or social value attached to being able to say, I bought this Burberry coat in England, or I bought this bag from a local designer in Italy. So now I'd like to turn over to our panelists, looking first at the data on Chinese overseas spending and tax-free shopping before hearing from some of the leading retailers. Um, so as our first speaker, um, I would like to welcome Zhang Yifan from Union Pay International. Wait a minute. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Joy Fan from Marketing and Branding Department of Union Pay International. So it's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to share insights on the trends of outbound transactions by Chinese tourists with all. Before we begin, let me briefly introduce 
uh, Union Pay. Union Pay is China's largest payment network. Uh, and aside from mainland China, Union Pay cards are accepted in 182 countries and regions. Overseas, we have 67 million merchants that accept Union Pay cards. So later, I will provide some insights based on the transaction data of Chinese cardholders abroad that we have observed. And now I would like to share some data on the post pandemic recovery trends of cross border travel in 2023. The number of Chinese outbound tourists has recovered to 60% of the pre pandemic levels in 2019. And this year, it is accepted to recover to about 80% of the pre pandemic levels. The recovery of international flight numbers this summer is roughly. 80% of what it was in uh, 2019. Looking at different regions, East Asia and Southeast Asia remain popular destinations, but there is still a gap compared to 2019. Therefore, it can be said that outbound travel is steadily recovering, but it has not yet fully returned to pre-pandemic levels. And we have deep cooperation with some online travel agencies or platforms in China. According to the ticket reservation data during the Dragon Boat Festival in June this year, the most popular overseas destination is Japan. On the one hand, it is because Japan is geographically close to China. And on the other hand, the exchange rate of Japan yen is falling recently. And the second destination is Hong Kong. And the third place is Thailand. We can see that the top 10 in the ranking are basically some regions relatively close to China, such as Southeast Asia or Hong Kong, Macau, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, in addition, we also analyze the user profile of those who like to travel overseas. They are mainly concentrated and develop the coastal areas with Guangdong ranking first, followed by Shanghai and Beijing. Having glancing through the general situation of outbound travel recovery, let's now take a look at the transaction trends on the Union Pay network. We will notice that actually after the pandemic, there have been changes in trends of Chinese car holders outbound transactions. The first change might be in the group tool. Before the pandemic, if tourists join a group tool, they would participate in larger groups, possibly with 20 or 30 people. Nowadays, people are placing more emphasis on the flexibility and the quality. So they tend to opt for more customized boutiques, more groups. These groups may pay more attention to the needs of tourists or and also avoid some potential safety problems. And the second change is reflected in the payment scenarios. Previously, it was perceived that Chinese people are keen on purchasing uh, luxury and the go to shopping centers, duty free shops, or outlets to buy uh, those luxury goods such as bags or cosmetics. However, after the pandemic, we noticed a polarizing trend. Those very wealthy still purchase high end luxury items, but many others are not so keen on luxury goods anymore. They feel like uh, luxury items are not a must buy when traveling abroad. Instead, they prefer to spend more money or trying local galaxies, getting massages, uh, beauty treatments, going to a, a concert or visiting tourist attractions to take photos and share them on their social media platforms. They may value the emotional benefits that travel brings them more, more than the happiness derived from shopping. And the third point is the change in consumption habits. Previously, Chinese tourists would consider shopping as the co-purchase of their outbound tri trips. However, now they are more inclined to uh, pri prioritize the experimental and spiritual reaction as a key goal of their travels, leading to a decrease in shopping designs. <clears throat> Sorry and consumption scenarios. For example, department stores in Hong Kong and Thailand have recovered much better than duty-free shops. And in some, market, in some market, the transactions in department stores 
have even outperformed the overall transaction recovery. The era when duty-free shops drove overall transaction has passed. And we also examined the average amount of each overseas transaction before and after the pandemic. Before the pandemic, it was nearly 2,000 RMB, but after the pandemic, it has decreased by 45%, dropping to around 1,400 RMB. Regarding merchant categories, among the top 10 outbound destinations, we see that both in terms of the number of transactions and the amount, dining and shopping have recovered faster, essentially returning to 80% of their uh, pre-pandemic levels. Following closely are accommodation and transportation merchants, which have recovered to over uh, 60% or above the overall recovery average. So that's all what I want to share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jiayifan. So now moving from the overall spending um, data that you see from union pay cardholders, I'd like to look specifically at spending data um, related to tax-free refunds um, and ask Mattia from Global Blue uh, to talk to us about Chinese shopping and tax-free shopping. Thank you, Sienna. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Let me just like share screen so this way you can all see the slides. So um, as Sienna mentioned, uh, just uh, let's uh, just uh, maybe a brief intro on Global Blue. So Global Blue, um, we are the global leader on uh, tax-free shopping. Uh, so uh, and we operate across forty-four countries as a destination for all people which are eligible, so for sure Chinese are very important. And um, differently compared to the number that we just seen, uh, we are very much focused on shopping. So things good that you can export, we are not, uh, our activity is not um, a valid for experience, food, hospitality. So we are on the concrete and material aspect. So let me share with you uh, our view, which I think will, uh, very much go in the same direction that we've just seen. Uh, the first one is, if we look at uh, the global uh, recovery of Chinese shoppers at free spend, so I, if we look overall at what is the panorama of Chinese doing shopping abroad and outside of China, what we can see is since Q1 and even more recently, if we look at April and May, which are the two last column, we are seeing an acceleration of a tax-free recovery, which is currently reaching 132%, 132% to be read as 32% above what was the tax-free shopping performance of Chinese in the same uh, global uh, uh, context in 2019. And as you can see, while we all know it has been taking a longer time because Chinese has reopened border for the uh, for Chinese national to travel outside of China only on Q1 2023, the acceleration is solid and is material in the range of even the other nationalities. So is the recovery is coming. The recovery is coming, but when we look at where do we go by region, so the blue bars representing the, the tax-free spend recovery month or quarter after quarter uh, for the Chinese in Europe and the green bar being Asia Pacific, we can see that up to mid last year, we were having a very partial recovery, which was almost equal between Europe and Asia Pacific. And since the second half of 2023, and even more uh, recently, we've seen a very significant acceleration of the recovery in Asia Pacific, which is reaching today to 221%, while the recovery into Europe is more stable in the range of 60%. What does this recovery is materializing? And I think we've discussed about it like, like a few minutes ago, is clearly there is Japan, boosted by proximity, um, openness to uh, Chinese tourists, and as well the effects and the price difference, which is capturing today an activity which is 258% compared to 2019 in May. So it means that 
currently tax-free spend in Japan is 2.5 times greater than what it was already in 2019, which was already a very significant destination, capturing 38% of the tax-free spend globally of the Chinese shops. Followed, in fact, very quickly by South Korea, which is as, which also seeing uh, a similar uh, attractiveness and boosted by the easy uh, easiness to go there, the visa situations, and as well the great cosmetics and experience uh, element that you can get at this destination. What you can see is the top three destinations are all Asians, with Singapore uh, recovering quicker than any other large European destination, but as you can see, the gap is significantly bigger. What does make Singapore uh, similar to uh, Italy, Spain, France, largely the FX and the, let's say, and the attractiveness of the destination in regards of what we see in Japan. In this context, we see that France, Spain, Italy have a recovery which is in the range of 60%. What is, what is our view on the, on the situation? And yes, the first one, and this is courtesy to our partner, which is for our keys, we can see that, let's say, across Europe, across APAC, across Europe, we can clearly see that the flight recovery, as we just seen, is only partial. And is very much, if we look at what's happening in Asia Pacific, in line with the passenger recovery. So it means that today we have all we have already, or if you look to the future, which is going to be even stronger, only 80% of the passengers that used to travel in 2019, which are currently getting into a plane. What we are seeing in Asia Pacific is to this 80% of passenger recovery, we have 80% people which are engaging into a tax-free activity, 81%. So we have a consistent ability and willingness to engage into shopping. And where does the big change is happening is how much they are spending in tax-free shopping per capita, which is in Asia Pacific, 175% greater than what it used to be in 2019. So what we are clearly seeing is what's driving the tax-free recovery uh, currently is the willingness and the ambition to spend big tickets, especially in Asia Pacific. What does make the difference if we compare, if we compare and contrast the two destinations is not the flight recovery, is a bit the passenger recovery, but it's not the base, is really the one, the fact that let's say the people which are at destination are currently engaging less into shopping activities. And when they engage into shopping activities, they spend 30% more compared to 2019, but not to the same magnitude that we have seen the acceleration in Asia Pacific. So really two different dynamics, two different elements, but what we can see is there is a willingness, and I think very much in line with what Siena was introducing to us uh, in a, a preliminary slide, there is a strong ambition to do shopping when, a, when at destination. And we see that when they are doing shopping, they are engaging into a lot more shopping compared to 2019. Profile-wise, I think it's, it's, it's very also interesting to see one thing is one currently the profile of people which are currently engaging at destinations uh, shopping at destination we see that ultra high net worth people which are spending more than twenty thousand euros on shopping abroad for uh, on the last 12 months we are seeing a greater concentration in terms of the spend expenditure similarly we have more affluent shoppers the one which are spending between three and twenty what you see to the right is the average spend per shopper. So clearly, let's say, there is a, a group of 18% of the shopper today which are spending more than 6,600, a blend, and which are accounting for 80% of the spend. So really, Pareto low, Pareto low, 20% of the shoppers account for 80% of the spend. So there is a concentration of wealth on Chinese, which is 10% greater than what we used to see in 2019, i.e. maybe the people which are facing more struggle in terms of wealth or in terms of economical limitations or which are concerned by other parameters than just like a traveler are not the one currently at destinations. Age-wise is clearly something that is further accelerating is the concentration of Gen Z and millennials, the one which are below 44, which 
used to carry about 50% of a shopper, 46% of spend. Clearly, we have an acceleration, uh, which is now 60% of the shoppers are below 44. And in fact, let's say in terms of expenditure, most of the groups have the same spending potential. So it's not anymore as well. The topic of young, less affluent is across the demographic, we see the relatively similar uh, affluency. Few slides and promise we stop there. What do we expect? What do we expect start from the past? If we look at the first two weeks of May where we had the golden week, usually Japan capture 33% in that period. So it's a bit less. If you remember in 2019, it was 38%. So usually during golden week, we see a greater in, in ambition to go to, um, to Europe and to other rest of Asia Pacific. In the last uh, golden week 2024, first weeks of May 2024, Japan captured 64% of the tax spend. So Japan really plays as a lighthouse of shopping currently. And similarly to what we just discussed, what we are clearly seeing is one, historically, when we are modeling the drivers for Chinese, mainland Chinese shoppers, we have seen that sensitivity to FX variation was one of the greatest. And it used to be measured around three. What does it mean is every time that the Chinese RMB uh, strengthened of one point versus any other currency, the tax risk spend of mainland Chinese on that destination increased by three. Currently, if we compare what's happening uh, in the blue bar on Chinese RMB versus Japanese yen, and on the yellow bar, Chinese yen versus euro, Chinese RMB versus euro, I, I think it's very clear and it's very clear for everyone in this call to say that, let's say, Japanese yen is softening, but in parallel, the euro is strengthening. So it's clearly the perfect storm to be make sure to make sure that you can find and you have strong motivation to go to Japan. And currently, if I annualize over the last two years, we have a 24 point gap between what was the euro and what is Japan in terms of attractiveness from an FX standpoint. Last but not least, uh, while the Japanese yen has softened, most of the brand have taken the, the direction to accommodate uh, to the Japanese yen. And currently, let's say the price gap to Europe uh, captured as France as a, as a, as a driver is closing and we are now uh, at a 5% gap between the price that you can find in Japan and the price you can find in Eurozone. This was 109 in Q1. And currently with the further strengthening of Japanese yen, most of the brands are taking uh, the choice to uh, accommodate for the, the, the local price and favor, let's say, and support the local shopping at the expenditure or the benefit of international shopper, which are finding in Japan very uh, relevant destinations in terms of spending. So overall, there is a lot of motivation for Chinese to, tra to travel and spend. So we are seeing that it's really pushing across all the destination and it's at 132. Clearly, let's say the air capacity or the motivation to travel are not yet in 2019 level, but we see a lot of ambition for H2 2024 and, uh, and following Q1 2025. And clearly, let's say if we look at the total spend is above 2019, largely fueled by the activities that is currently in Japan, but Japan is currently capturing the benefit of the other destinations. So I think it's, uh, in our view, it's is a strong momentum. It will continue to accelerate because shopping and travel are part of the key motivation of the Chinese uh, shoppers. Uh, and but in terms of mix between the different global destination, there is Japan that is currently uh, favorable conditions and which has attracting a lot more compared to other destinations. I think that I would be stopping here for uh, for for my part and and you back to uh, to you, Sina. Thank you so much, Mathieu. That's really interesting. One of the things I thought was very interesting that both you and Zhang Yifan talked about um, kind of the wealthier segment of Chinese travelers now um, continuing to spend and maybe even spend more, um, whereas um, 
kind of less wealthy travelers are now prioritizing things like experiences instead of shopping. So um, very interesting to see from the two of you. Um, so now from the financial data, we will shift over to talking to some retailers um, and start with uh, Marcelo from the Bister Collection um, to tell us a little bit about the, introduce the Bister Collection uh, and your approach to the Chinese market. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sienna and Dragon Trail for inviting us to, to be part of this session. So I will use my five minutes, uh, one, to give a quick uh, intro on who we are and how we prepare our villages for the Chinese consumers, of course, for all of the travelers, but the focus today is on the Chinese consumer. Uh, through four slides and a quick video. And then I will tell you what are the trends we are experiencing, especially in the last uh, year, 12 months. Uh, what is the guest profile we are getting into our villages? What is our performance? And then open to Q&As. So next slide, please. So who we are? We are a creative of flagship retail experiences. So all what we wanna do is just to host and receive our Chinese consumer the best way we can. Also with our knowledge, uh, thanks to our two villages in China, I touch on this in a second. We serve other retailers. Uh, we work with all different brands. We have across the collection 1,500 boutiques. So we really um, have a great relationship with all of these brands and a great product selection too. We partner with leading uh, travel companies to make it happen. And of course, we, we are host of uh, happy travelers. And now all they want is to bring back home uh, wonderful memories. So we move to the next uh, slide. Uh, we have at the moment 11 villages, uh, nine in Europe, in London, in Milan, Munich, Dublin, Barcelona, Paris, Madrid, Brussels, Frankfurt, two in China, in Shanghai and in Suzhou. And good news is that uh, 18th of September, we open our number 12 village in New York. Next slide. And all what we do, especially for the Chinese consumers, actually, is that we create memories, as I told you before, listening to Matthew, to uh, Chan, um, experiences. They are looking, shopping is important, but at the same time, they need more than that. So as a collection, we are now uh, working on different services. Uh, private spaces, the apartment, which is like um, um, our VIP lounge, let's say. We see more and more people into hands-free shopping. They are all into about VIP passes, right, to have fast track, personal shopping, dedicated concierge. Um, we can create private brand appointments and current season sellers, actually. So we bring from full price store uh, that same season a uh, special product so i will play a 60 seconds video that summarizes everything and then i'll give you our trends Bisita 更是饕客寻觅珍馐佳肴的天堂
，我们众受其心，为卓越精雕细琢，邂逅心动时刻，演绎奢华格调，以隽永优雅呈现无暇服务。精妙绝伦的建筑设计，铭心难忘的美好回忆，宾至如归的贴心服务，每时每刻，精彩由此展开。李斯特系列，邀您一起开启非凡购物之旅，众手齐心，雕铸卓越。Perfect. I will share the、uh, English version、um, for those that. Like like me, do not speak、uh, Mandarin, and、uh, so let me give you now、um, explain you a little bit. What are we experiences with our Chinese traveler? What do we know about them now?、Um, so profile, who is coming to our villages? Again, super aligned with my colleagues. Fifty percent of the people we receive in our eleven villages nowadays are between millennials and Gen Z. And 80% out of all this、uh, footfall we get are first-time travelers to Europe. So it is a great opportunity. You know, it's the, the, the trip of their life. So we really need to make sure that they feel like at home.、Uh, most of the guests spend around three or four hours av average. Okay, but of course we have people that spend the whole day with us. But on average, I would say four hours. Uh, top three top brand sub segments: fashion apparel, outdoor, and accessories. And of course, the SPV of these people、um, less footfall, but they are spending around 30 to 40 percent more than、uh, before pandemic. Our performance、uh, now is still Greater China. Shoppers hold our top position among all of the other nationalities. Um, we are seeing a recovery versus 2019 of 50% recovery. Okay, and、um, what I can say is that、um, our key destinations in Europe, as you said, Matthew, are Italy, Paris, and both Spanish villages.、Um, what are they looking in our villages? So. We detected value for money in all our communications. Whatever we say, this is something very specific. They are behind,、uh, of course, the staff who can communicate in Mandarin perfectly.、Um, everything spoken, written everywhere they go around our villages, they will feel、uh, very welcomed in their language.、Um, they are more comfortable、um, avoiding queuing, queues.、Um, So important, taxed, refound kiosk, and this is why our long-term partner、uh, Global Blue is key for us. This is probably one of the most important touch points in within the guest journey in the village.、Uh, something that is easy, fast. We always have personal staff who who can give support on this.、Um, expect diverse range of brands, not only luxury.、Uh, they are so into the local、uh, brands, niche brands. Tell me about your local talents,、uh, products that cater Asian body sizes, of course. And another point is they value fashion inclusivity and products that are not gender specific. Some of the other trends against smaller groups, family oriented, super exclusive. Safety remain one of the main criteria. Discounted shopping, as I told you before, and、um, again. Experiences within the village, whether it is an art installation, whether there is something related to music and gastronomy,、uh, top priority. So I leave gastronomy as、uh, the most important part of that visit. And with this, I pause it here and open to question later. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. That's、uh, really good information. Um, so now, last but not least,、um, I'd like to move to a new shopping destination、uh, for Chinese travelers and and all travelers in Madrid,、uh, with Silvia speaking from Galleria Canalejas. Thank you, Sienna. 
Um, good morning from Spain to everyone. Um, Silvia de Tejada, and I would like to thank you first to Dragon Trail for organizing this webinar and for extending the invitation to me. It is truly an honor to be here, uh, surrounded by all the key players and partners from the retail, payments, and travel industry. So thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I'm going to introduce briefly um, Galeria Canalejas, as it is a uh, project that has been uh, created after the pandemic. So Galeria Canalejas, it's the new international icon of luxury and shopping uh, and all cuisine in the heart of Madrid. It is located in Madrid, a city with a unique lifestyle with an incomparable historical and cultural legacy. Um, and Madrid has a, also a welcoming nature, so invites all the Chinese and cosmopolitan visitors to immerse themselves in the experience that is Madrid. This project, as I said, um, starts after the pandemic in 2020 with the opening of Hermes Boutique. And it's it has been a new concept that transformed seven historical buildings into four businesses, including the first Four Seasons Hotel and of course the iconic Galeria Canalejas that we're going to present. We have over 30 fashion boutiques, fine jewelry, accessorized beauty, and perfumeries combined to transform Galeria Canalejas into the city's new golden mile and international luxury destination. We are just um, walking distance from the main um, attractions, luxury hotels, museum, theaters, musicals, restaurants, and meeting places of Madrid. And we are surrounding by uh, over 30, and now, now I should say over 15 to 20 five stars hotel because Madrid, since the pandemic, has completely been refurbished and um, international hotels change like Edition Four Seasons, Mandarin Oriental, JW Marriott, Hyatt, uh, have arrived to Madrid. So Madrid has become a new luxury destination in Europe and Galeria Canalejas, which is here in the city center, it is surrounded by the five stars hotels all around. Of course, we have a magnificent food hall where um, our visitors can find the finest rices and paellas and discover new flavors from international culinary restaurants. Um, it's home to over 30 restaurants and bars. And again, it's in the heart of Madrid with a nice a space, um, not crowded at all, and with a fantastic um, food and gastronomy inside. Um, we also are very proud to offer a magnificent experience. We have a Mandarin staff that is taking care of the Chinese visitors that um, are um, visiting Galeria Canalejas. And of course, we are um, also offering our tax-free shopping with the uh, Global Blue in all the main of the boutiques. And just five minutes away from Galeria Canalejas, we have a cash refund point, which is very convenient, again, for Chinese travelers that want to get the cash refund inside the city. Um, part of the experiences that we have been talking about during this webinar, we've created and we've curated three different experiences for our international and Chinese visitors. The first of them, it's the private historical tour. When I joined this company, one of the things that I really liked the most was the history behind, because this um, this uh, building, Galeria Canalejas, together with the rest of the three businesses, um, were previously the main banks of Spain, newspapers and insurance companies. So in this historical tour, we offer all the visitors a 30 minute walking tour through the historical pictures that we rescued from 1887 to the present, and we'll, we reveal the monumental effort involved in rescuing the historical and cultural heritage of Madrid. Um, in this tour, I will take and discover the visitors um, some interesting facts like the materials that some of the luxury boutiques have used when um, creating their iconic boutiques inside the gallery, or what has remained, what has been preserved from the banks, the main banks of Spain and the insurance companies. 
The second experience that we offer, of course, if, is um, oriented to shopping. Uh, we offer private shopping experience to put you an example of one of the things that we've done for Asian clients is that we have opened in private um, one hour before the opening uh, time for a very reduced group of, um, of visitors. So they had the opportunity of having the entire monumental gallery open for them. Um, this is one of the things that we can do inside this monumental luxury gallery in the heart of Madrid. And of course, we can also offer um, private arrangement with uh, boutiques. And um, one of the advantages of uh, Galeria Canalejas is that it's surrounded by the main five stars hotels of Madrid. So all the boutiques have a specialized to have the limited edition items. Um, inside these boutiques compared to other spots in the city. Finally, we have one more experience, uh, very focused on arts and history because we discovered that the Chinese um, consumers and Chinese visitors are requesting even more experiences um, together with the city. So we partnered with the Royal Academy of Fine Arts of San Fernando to explore um, this museum and this Royal Academy, which has been the house of Goya for 29 years. So the Royal Academy of Fine Arts of San Fernando, it's a gem um, that was born with the uh, change from the Austrias to the uh, Bourbon Kings in Spain. And we are offering a private visit behind closed doors uh, to this um, historical venue in Madrid. It's just in front of Galeria Canalejas, where the clients can attend to an engraving workshop. Um, we're going to take us at 18th century copper plate from Goyas, or one of the uh, main artist's creations. And we are going to do an engraving um, workshop and finally, the clients will, gift it, will be gifted with uh, the masterpiece uh, of this engraving workshop um, to end up with these fantastic experiences. We will offer the clients a dinner at our St. James restaurant, which is the perfect, the picture perfect paella and one of the iconic rice and Mediterranean restaurants in Madrid. So this is a little bit um, all the experiences that we can offer inside Galeria Canalejas. And I am sure that we're going to share more um, together uh, in the future with you. So thank you, Dragon Trail, for giving me the opportunity. Oh, thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, so now um, we have, <laughs> we're left with around uh, 10 minutes or a little bit more um, to ask some questions of the panel. So, um, and I see some of the questions I had prepared are similar to the questions from the audience. So that is, that's a good overlap. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask, um, first of all, um, of Marcelo and Sylvia about what marketing activities you're doing to attract Chinese travelers uh, to your destinations. And let's uh, let's start with Marcelo. Okay, so um, we do B2B2C. So when it comes to B2B, we play with the uh, key to the operators and agencies, of course. So our communication with them is to present the perfect day out that they can sell to their con uh, customers. Number two, we work, of course, with uh, digital financial payments, and we are happy to be part of their channels when it comes to communicate our day out offer. Uh, airlines as well, we have loyalty program. Um, this moment for Asia or Greater China, we have Asian Miles and China Southern, uh, China Eastern. Um, in conversations with Air China too. And then B2C is mainly WeChat mini programs for each of our destinations and Red Little Book. So these are the main key ones. We have many others, but this, these are the important ones. So we can feed on a monthly basis what is new, what is happening, new season, new products, special installations, special offers, private um, uh, private campaigns, uh, sales, etc. So with all these, basically, 
there is always much more we could do, but so far this is um, how we run it. And we do have a strong team on the ground in China. And um, so we have the team divided into six offices uh, so they can really localize and talk to the languages, whether it is simplified Chinese or, or Mandarin, um, the communication varies too. Thank you. And Sylvia, what have you done, especially as a new destination that Chinese travelers uh, wouldn't have been able to go to before the pandemic since it didn't exist yet? So basically, I found out that I really needed to go to a back to basics when I joined Galeria Canaleja. So from creating a Chinese name to a starting um, uh, getting to know and getting to um, show Galeria Canaleja to Chinese uh, travel agencies, as well as Marcelo has informed in mainland China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. So in this first year, uh, or these two first years, we've been very focused on the B2B and complementing with the B2C promotions through all the um, travelers' journey. So for example, as Marcelo has said as well, um, we are um, collaborating with uh, travel payment platforms, like for example, C-Trip offering as well exclusive access to clients that um, pay with uh, the Chinese payment methods, or um, for example, um, uh, joining Chinese festivities like Chinese New Year, and the upcoming Golden Week. We have Chinese New Year's and Golden Week specials as well. And I'm sure that uh, Mr. Realis also has. So we are trying to fusion culture and getting or helping also Chinese uh, visitors to get to know a little bit more of Madrid by fusioning um, Madrid and China with the occasion of the Chinese festivities. Also collaboration with airlines as well. We are also in, in, in contact with Hainan, with Air China as well. And um, we've collaborated in the past with China Eastern for um, the past golden week. And I'm sure that uh, there will, we will have more time to develop more, more uh, opportunities in the future as this is a very new project. Thank you. Um, now, another changing gears totally, a question I wanted to ask um, as somebody in the UK is that the UK uh, got rid of uh, tax-free shopping for uh, foreign visitors at the start of 2021. And I'd be very interested to know how this may be impacting uh, Chinese spending uh, in Britain already. So I wanted to ask Zhang Yifan um, if you if your data shows any major differences um, comparing uh, before the pandemic to now in terms of shopping or spending in Britain? Uh, actually, uh, in terms of transaction volume, uh, Hong Kong and Macau remain the largest, largest cross-border markets both before and after pandemic. Uh, probably due to their proximity and extensive coverage of the Union Pay Acceptance Network there. And uh, ac uh, according to the data in Britain, they're not uh, among the uh, top 10 ranking, but we can see uh, uh, a, a, boost, a boost in the, the Britain market, because maybe mostly because of the travel and a uh, business trip or uh, study yeah so you have you haven't seen um, a reduction in spending in britain now compared to how it was before the yes. pandemic okay um that's promising um in terms of um retail looking at the bister collection um marcelo can you see a, a difference in the spending of Chinese tourists or visitation to uh, Bister Village uh, compared mm -hmm. to the other destinations in Europe? Yes, I have to say yes. We have seen slightly dropped. What we are noticing, especially three weeks ago, it started to pick up, okay? Uh, Paris and Spain instead, you know, were, I don't want to say booming, but compared to UK where it was number one, far 
ahead from Paris or, or Spain now. France and Spain are ahead. And, but definitely, yes, it was something uh, that impacted the whole retail industry. This is what we think and see. Okay. Um, and I wanted to ask um, each of you, and maybe we can um, come back to Mathieu because I haven't asked you anything um, yet. If you could all summarize kind of maybe in one or two sentences what you think it, or is the most or the most significant changes in the way that Chinese travelers are shopping overseas in 2024 compared to 2019. In one line. Um... Well, you can have a few lines, but <laughs> just uh, briefly, uh, kind no, of what uh, what is the core of what's the biggest change? First, I think let's say first is is an absence of change. I, I strongly believe, and your data showing it, and all, all the time is shopping is a key part of the souvenir and the travel moments. So uh, I think what Marcelo is showing, what Celia is showing, is is very true. Is is a key moment in the in the travel and in the trip. And it's remain very important. Two is thanks to the brands which have invested in China as we have never seen before in the past. There is an awareness and a culture for the Western brands which are available in Paris, London, Madrid, and so on, which is greater, which is driving more footfall and an easier engagement with a brand at destination. And there is a new generation. Uh, the new, I think, a younger profile, mm -hmm. uh, more accustomed to the Western standards uh, than the former generation, because I think they have been educated in that world, which is more open, and which are willing to engage, but they are a significant greater expectations in terms of not only physical goods, but the experience being digital, frictionless, uh, as excellent as it could be, which are making uh, all of our job uh, more exciting every day, but more challenging because it's a uh, it's a it's a, it's a it's a new wave and a new uh, big element that is coming, and uh, the shopping will be there. Chinese are, uh, from what we can get, still willing to get to to engage into shopping. I think the, the, the expectations are to level up compared to what we have seen in 2019. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, Zhang Yifan, what would you say you think are the, the biggest changes since the pandemic? Yeah, so firstly, we see uh, transportation, including the recharge of online transit cards and also dining. Uh, have seen a large number of transactions recovering very quickly compared to uh, pre-pandemic levels. And additionally, transactions in tourism ticketing and the supermarket uh, merchants continue to grow steadily. And according to the information shared by some travel agencies, uh, medical, cosmetics, and concert economy also drive scenarios for uh, Chinese tourists overseas spending. So many people now travel to South Korea for freckle removal or wrinkle treatment, get vaccinated in Hong Kong, or attend maybe like Taylor Swift's concerts in Singapore. So therefore, the reasons driving Chinese people to travel abroad are changing, and consequently, so are the consumption scenarios. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, Silvio, um, what about for you? I know that Galleria Canalejas is new, but you've been involved in retail and the Chinese market for uh, quite some time too. Yes. In the line uh, of uh, my what my colleagues had said, I think it has been an interesting shift um, in consumers or shift into experience-based goods, specifically fine art, luxury cars, private jets, for example, fine wines, gourmet food. Um, so actually I've read recently that consumer goods are expected to grow um, 
Um, so this, this type of goods and experiences that are expected to grow at 10% over the last year, where whether the luxury products will grow approximately around a three, four percent. So it has been also interesting to discover in my last, last trip to China, the shift um, also in the brands, um, like uh, for example, here at Galeria Canalejas, more and more brands are offering experiences, in-store experiences, open in restaurants, hotels, and other experiential um, experiences uh, in very important venues in the city. So this is a shift that I've been experiencing um, with with the, the the evolution of the travel trends in China. Great, interesting. Um, and then uh, finally, <laughs> we'll end with Marcelo um, with the biggest changes you've seen. I mean, my colleagues say them all, but I would summarize that if you want to play in this arena for the Chinese consumer, as expectations are so high and uh, we have such a savvy guest coming on a mission. So if you fail once, you know, it could the impact could be very high. And uh, so younger generation in China is all about digital, right? Even shopping, but that physical experience, something that we are always supporting, of course, because ours is physical, has to be impeccable, Chinese-oriented, and uh, the discovery of the local brands. You know, I'm shocked in 2019, I'm not going to name any brands, but we all know the big drivers, how that is shifting to... I'm still shocked when they ask me for... I'm also based in Spain, like Silvia, some very... Uh, new small Spanish brands, how they are uh, getting traction with this market. So, and you know what, maybe what we are saying here today in six months is completely different, no? So it's, it's great that we share all these insights together. And I think uh, if we play in this arena, we all play together, right? Uh, for me, Sylvia, your product is fantastic. And, you know, we are very close to each other. And I think we need to play together because, you know, in the afternoon they come to me, then it comes to you. And play together is a winning car. Yes. Spain is a fantastic place also because of the tax refund here. So, yes, we definitely should play together. Oh, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so I think we're about to wrap up now. We've actually gone a little bit over time. So thank you very much uh, for um, staying with me. Um, just before um, we wrap up, I wanted to um, announce Dragon Trail's next webinar, uh, which is coming up in just under five weeks on Tuesday, the 30th of July. Uh, this webinar will be focusing on working with the Chinese travel trade, and we'll be revealing the results of Dragon Trail's second annual Chinese outbound travel trade survey. Um, so you can get the freshest insights on what Chinese travel agents are selling and looking for in 2024. We've also teamed up with the leading travel trade event, COTTM, for the session, and they'll be introducing more information about ways to meet and do business with Chinese travel agents in Beijing later in the year. Uh, registration for that webinar is already open um, on the events page of the Dragon Trail website, and you'll also get the registration link in today's presentation slides, which I'm going to be sharing with everyone later today. Um, so thank you so much to all of our panelists for your fantastic presentations and insights. Um, I know we could have spent hours asking you more questions. Um, and thank you very much to everyone who joined the webinar today. And we hope to see you all again next month. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.